Okay, so I'm going to present a very much cut down, um, tiny proportion um, of research that relates to some work I've been doing funded by the Wellcome Trust, looking at um, an artifactual and symbolic category, and looking in particular at the way in which material culture um, and archaeological artifacts inform um, symbols or signs and the way in which we think about them. And I'm going to look today in particular at the late 19th and um, early 20th century. The project um, is actually much broader than that, but uh, I'm a, I can only present a small proportion of my research here today. So I'm just going to begin by introducing the project, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about this category, the phallus, and um, its historical construction. And I'm going to talk in then about two objects in particular which were excavated from Windmill Hill, Causeway and Enclosure, and then I'm going to hopefully open it up to some questions. So you kind of catch this project at an interesting moment because um, I'm in a stage of developing it in, this, in some interdisciplinary directions. And uh, so I hope I'm going to get some good, some interesting feedback from an archaeological audience today. So one of the things that informs my interest in archaeological histories are the ways in which histories of archaeology allow us to rethink what archaeology is. Archeo the archaeology that we practice today isn't the archaeology of the late 19th century or the mid 20th century. Uh, in fact, there are some very surprising and often unsettling um, understandings of what archaeology is and histories of the discipline allow us to rethink the discipline potentially. So that's why uh, in some recent papers I've been thinking a bit about Colton and Chapman and those sorts of things um, and a paper that I did last year with Martin um, who's also explored some of these issues uh, in relation to looking at the 20th century concrete on prehistoric sites and how might that enable us to interrogate prehistory, its formation, what it is. So I'm interested in archaeology's contribution to the formation of one of the 20th century's most important symbols, a symbol that's been central to the construction of masculinity and psyche, and in particular has been very important in, through the medium of psychoanalysis. So in this project, I've been interested in looking at the way in which an archaeology under the process of forces, uh, under the process of disciplinization, professionalization, is informed by other emerging disciplines, anthropology, psychoanalysis, and sexology. So we, we need to hold on to the fact that archaeology is in potentia in the periods I'm talking about, as are these other disciplines. And, so, and it, all these disciplines together, in relation to antiquity, the primitive, and material, material objects, and the agency of those objects, that influences those processes of formation. So the, the Wellcome Trust research um, involved me going to the archives I selected nine objects from the British Neolithic and Bronze Age and I was interested in looking uh, not just at the published history of those objects but the way in which they were handled, they were distributed, the way in which they were written about in letters and site diaries and those kinds of things, the way in which they were displayed in museums. And one of the really interesting, one of the great things about starting with prehistoric phyllae is they're really ambiguous objects very often. <laughs> and when you actually go and look at them, you know, what, what really are they? And, and, and they, therefore, they were really, really useful um, opportunity to think about how we make sense and why we make sense of material culture in particular ways at particular moments. So I'm going to talk very briefly um, and in a much truncated fashion about 
the phallus as a concept. So the word phallos is Greek and it emerges in association, it's, it's used to describe an object carried in the Dionysiac rites and also some elements of costume worn in the Dionysiac rites. But over the course of the modern period, in particular from the 18th century, it begins to be expanded to cover a really vast range of phenomena. And psychoanalysis over the course of the 20th century it accelerates that. So we have the phallic symbol and everything from cigarettes to skyscrapers becomes potentially phallic. But the, the formation of that, so what I'm interested in, how is it that a word that's used to describe a, a proportion of material objects from the Mediterranean in a particular time comes with modernity to be expanded to lots of objects? So one among the key people for understanding how this happens are the phallus collectors of the 18th century. Uh, many of whom uh, are ex extremely notable collectors, key donors to the British Museum. This is Charles Townley's library. So Charles Townley, William Hamilton, and um, here's some of the objects that William Hamilton donated to the um, British Museum. Wax, sex photos, contemporary, you know, of the late 18th century that he saw as a continuation of pagan worship, pagan phallic worship. So among these gentlemen of the Society de la Tante who were collecting um, phallic objects and very much constructing the category of the phallic at this time was Richard Payne Knight who writes an account of the worship of Priapus in which he argues that the origin of all world religions is worship of the generative organs. Payne Knight is a fascinating free thinker um, and uh, sex radical in some ways of the late 18th century. <coughs> right, so this, this book that becomes incredibly influential. Initially it's privately published but it continues to circulate and as I'll show you it has an afterlife uh, in psychoanalysis not least. One of the things which might be familiar to people who work on prehistoric sites in Britain that Payne Knights argues is that phallic worship might be part of the design of megaliths um, among those that he writes about Stonehenge. He doesn't use the word megalith, obviously that's an anachronism of the late 18th century. Um, but this idea of... Um, phallic worship and phallic architecture gets expanded around the world in the 1800s and in, into the new world through the work of Ephraim Squires. It also, there's also comes to be a distinct body of material artefacts that are seen as phalli. And influentially, Schliemann writes at length about phallic idols that he finds in Troy too. The Trojans, in a period where uh, diffusionism is very important, the Trojans, incredible Trojan material culture is incredibly important because it might potentially spread. So, I haven't got time here to uh, explore this particular history, but there's a really interesting uh, connection between phallic worship and the gendering of scholarly authority. In particular, um, the Anthropological Society of London, which was formed in 1862, explicitly to counter the fact that the Ethnological Society had voted to admit women. And one of the things that they wanted to preserve and thought was particularly important to scientific freedom was the ability to talk about phallic worship. These scientists, these male scientists, felt that they couldn't possibly talk about phallic worship if women were present and therefore science would be impeded. So um, they had one of their initiatives was the republication of Payne Knight's book, and it circulated in numerous editions ever since. They also, key members of the Anthropological Society of London, uh, also collected large <coughs> quantities of pornography 
and George Witt had an immense pilot connection, oh my gosh, um, <laughs> that uh, came into the British Museum. So among the phallus connectors, kind of phallus collectors really important is Sigmund Freud, who also owned Payne Knight and cited it um, in his um, writings about the phalli. So the phalli of Windmill Hill. Windmill Hill, um, really important because it's um, the first well-defined prehistoric culture of British culture history. This is Windmill Hill Causeway Enclosure. Um, I'm going to focus on two of its excavators whose archives I've been working with, Harold St George Grey and uh, Alexander Keeler. St George Grey definitely was aware of phallic worship. He collected items for Pitt Rivers, including phallic items. Um, so he was, you know, belongs in that 19th century tradition of phallus collectors. Here's the phallus he excavated at Malmesbury Rings in 1912, um, of great interest to students of phallic worship. In many ways, he is uh, an archaeologist in the 19th century vein of phallic interests, um, rationalised within the comparative method. So you see here that he writes in his excavation notebooks about Egyptian sites in relation to this, the first phallus from Windmill Hill. He also treats the objects in a way that's incredibly redolent of the Anthropological Society of London. Men handle the phalli among men. So in this letter, he's saying that, uh, thank you very much for the grass. Um, my wife took the grass away while I showed the Windmill Hill phallus to Father Horn. So, <laughs> so Windmill Hill, famously, was a very unhappy excavation. Harrison George Gay was thrown off by the landowner, and the letters certainly record a great deal of antagonism between Gray and uh, Alexander Keeler. Just here, by the end, Gray is completely off. Keeler has control of the phalli and also the excavation. Keeler is a really interesting figure and offers perhaps an alternative approach to interpreting phalli to um, Howard St George Grey. If Howard St George Grey is in the tradition of the comparative method, Keeler is rather more leaning towards uh, the beginnings of culture history and the way he treats these objects. He's also um, potentially could be seen as a sex researcher in the sense that um, he hired sex workers in order to investigate sexual practices and then typed it up in triplicate. It's, whilst this seems unusual for a prehistoric archaeologist, it isn't necessarily in the period. If archaeologists are concerned with investigating the primitive mind, they're also concerned with investigating sexuality, potentially. Keeler also owns a huge number of books on the history of sexuality, including um, many volumes by sexologists, in particular Havelock Ellis. So one of the interesting things about the second Windmill Hill Phallus that's identified by Gray is that Keeler reclassifies it, has, well, allows it to be reclassified by Gordon Child as a figurine. And in lots of ways, this shows that he's got a very different approach to Howard St George Grey. And he's able to understand these objects as ambiguous and as things that might travel between genders rather interestingly. Another interesting thing about Alexander Keeler is the presence of large numbers of women among his excavation staff, which certainly isn't the case with St George Grey. So, Keeler uh, exhibits the phalli through these uh, in his house. Um, he has here's the exhibition catalogue, and it's exhibited it's in the through a kind of as a cultural historical object rather than um, in a comparative fashion. So it's contextualised within as an item of Windmill Hill um, culture. And here you can see phalli. One of those is identified later by uh, Isabel Smith. So I'm going to talk about um, Alexander Keeler's collaborator, uh, colleague, Stuart Piggott, who goes on to make a career, really, in, in some ways, an important contribution in defining what the Neolithic phallus is in particular. Here he is on his excavations at Thickthorn Down. Um, among Piggott is so interested in phalli that he starts to begin to compile a kind of incipient typology of phalli 
and he does things. Here's the bone phallus that he found at the trundle. This flint, uh, serrated flint blade, he thought might have been used to manufacture that phallus and begin to get whole proliferation of material culture and the way in which it relates to other items of material culture in a very culture historical mode. So these are the phalli uh, that Piggott and um, under the foremanship of Weeby Young finds at Thickthorn Down. Uh, the excavation notebooks, interesting, write really interestingly about the context of the discovery of these objects, but also contain a lot of correspondence about post holes that they, that Young thought, formed a kind of phallic avenue uh, up to the Long Barrow at Thickthorn Down. So this idea of there being kind of architecture of phallic worship continues in the way these uh, archaeologists write about these prehistoric sites. So the phalli have a real particular importance for Piggott in terms of debates over the origins of the Roman Hill culture. Um, Stuart Piggott thinks that an Anatolian phallic cult might explain, m- might provide support for his idea that the origins of Wimmer Hill were other than the um, Central European origins that she had hawks go for it. So the phalli have a, come to have a whole different salience to the way to the salience they had in the comparative method under culture history. So I'm going to end with this object here. With both these objects, most probably are not prehistoric objects, though they were certainly constructed as such at the time. The Grimesgrave goddess uh, may have been carved, although it's not definitive. But it seems probable that it was carved by Ethel Rudkin, the famous folklorist. And the Grimesgrave phalli, um, Pamela Jane Smith has collected evidence from oral testimony, testimony from Stuart Piggott that he manufactured this object. So, oops, oh, one minute. So, we've got two forgeries um, that really. Um, uh, if you look at the way Piggott writes, doesn't write about, writes about the goddess, but doesn't write about the phalli, it's particularly telling. <laughs> okay, so um, the goddess and phalli forgeries, Piggott must have been delighted, are really snapped up by Jaquetta Hawkes, his old enemy of the Windmill Hill controversy, and uh, are displayed, the goddess in particular, at the Festival of Britain, and written about by Hawkes in very Jungian terms. Hawkes met Young. She also dedicated a book to him. And we can see the ways in which these forgeries come to be really important with a certain idea of animus and anima in her work in particular. So, um, I'm just, I've rushed through all that in a way that uh, possibly doesn't hang together <laughs> everything about the research. Um, but uh, one of the things I wanted to do today was to open this up to questions. I find the ambiguity of these prehistoric objects really fascinating. I think it's, that's part of their real potential. But it's interesting how unambiguous the forgery is, by contrast. Um, and one of the things that I've that I'm beginning to explore around these objects is the way in which these categories relate to extradisciplinary debates. Okay, I'm going to stop there.